Well, guys, tonight's lesson is called Carry Your Torches. And the whole theme of this retreat weekend was torches. And this idea is that God has given you a flame to carry. He's saved your soul. He's worked in your life in such a profound way and has lit up your world. And he wants us to carry this torch that he's given us to the ends of the earth. He wants us to be able to do this wholeheartedly, to do this collectively, to do this individually. What we do is we carry our torch. It's, it's who we are as disciples. It's this light that he's given us. And we're called to go light up the world around us. And in order to carry our torches, to carry them proudly, to carry them tall, to carry them strong, there's a few dynamics that we got to really figure out. The first dimension is this. We got to carry our torch and follow Jesus. Mm -hmm. We got to carry our torch and follow Jesus. Everything we do as disciples begins and ends with this call to follow Jesus. Jesus is the very source, the very light that light up our world and has lit us up and, and inspires us to set the night on fire. It is Jesus and it's following Jesus that makes us come alive, that makes us who we are. In John 8 verse 12, Jesus says this, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. See, following Jesus is about carrying our torch. And when we follow Jesus, he lights up our torch. He makes our whole life on fire. And he calls us not to keep this source to ourselves, but to carry it to the very ends of the earth. Listen to these passages as Jesus describes what it looks like to truly follow him and to light up the world around us. Matthew 4 verse 19 says, come follow me. Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. Matthew 8, verse 22 says, but Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Matthew 9, 23, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. Matthew 10, verse 38, whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Mark 10, verse 21, Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and then you'll have treasure in heaven. Come, follow me. Luke 9, verse 23, he said to him, anyone who wants to come after me must deny himself. Take up this cross daily and follow me. John 10, verse 27 says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. John 21, verse 22, Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is it to you? You must follow me. And John 12, verse 26 says, whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant will also be. My father will honor the one who serves me. As you can tell from these passages, it's clear that Jesus calls us to follow him. He demands that we follow him. He wants us to follow him closely, wholeheartedly, eternally. He wants us to follow him with every breath in our body until our dying day. He demands that we deny ourselves, drop everything, obey him, imitate him, and follow him. There's nothing on the face of this earth that should get in the way of us carrying our torch and following Jesus. Our greatest need as disciples is to carry this torch with all that we got, to follow Jesus. Nothing else in this world truly matters if we're not following Jesus with our whole heart. This commitment to following Jesus, is, it's what distinguishes us from all the other pseudo-Christian groups on our campuses. It's what makes us true disciples. It's what separates us from the world. It's the very thing that lit your world on fire when you started following Jesus and believing him in the first place, it's the thing that transformed your life. This is the invitation to discipleship and this initiation to the wildest adventure of your life. It all begins and ends with the call to follow Jesus, no matter what it will cost you and no matter where it will take you. You can't afford or manage to follow anything else other than Jesus. You can't follow both Jesus and something else. It's either he's got your all and your best or nothing at all. And it's so easy to let other things overtake our torch 
and distract our followership of Jesus. And we got to be aware of this and we got to be on our guard because some of us are following the world and not Jesus. You so desperately want to fit in, to be accepted, to have this fake security that you sell your soul to obtain it. And the way that you dress, the music that you listen to, the shows that you're consuming and watching, the social media that you're binging on, the judgmental and critical hearts that are overflowing out of you. You've consumed junk and it's polluted the very light and torch inside of you and it's left you empty. Some of you are more passionate about your opinions, more passionate about your food, your sports, the environment, hobbies, your Instagram, than you are about following Jesus. And that is a shame. Jesus should be the greatest priority in our life. You can't follow both Jesus and the world. Who are you following? Now, some of us are following ourselves. Your pride and insecurity leads you to such a great independence that you've built this wall so tall and so wide around your life that God's word can't penetrate it, God's people can't penetrate it, and you put yourself on this island that you won't listen to advice, you won't listen to the scriptures, you follow yourself first. You follow what you feel, you follow what you want, you follow your desires, and Jesus comes second. Jesus said, whoever wants to follow me must deny themselves. Whoever wants to save their life must lose their life. You can't follow both Jesus and yourself. Who are you following? Some of us are following pleasures and happiness in this world. Now, looking at pornography is crippling your connection to real life and to people. Chasing romantic relationships to feel complete, over sleeping, over eating, over watching, letting your stomach be the desires that are leading you forward. Satan has convinced you that somehow these pleasures will fulfill you and make you happy. But in fact, they are starving you and robbing you of true purpose and joy in your life and leaving you empty. You can't follow both Jesus and pleasure. Who? Are you following? You know, some of us are following a fake form of Christianity. You say Jesus is Lord, but he doesn't really know you because you're not truly following him. Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? You've spent months going through the motions of Christianity. You've attended services. You've praised them. But when push comes to shove in your life, not really following Jesus. You don't deny yourself. You're not sold out for the mission, sharing your faith, making disciples. You're not reading your Bibles daily. You're not into openness and confessing your sin. You're not growing in character, weaknesses in yourself. You're acting like everything is okay. I'm all right. I'm just part of the ministry. But yet you've gone through the motions and deceived yourself into following a ghost. You can't follow fake Christianity and also follow the Jesus of the Bible. Who are you following? You know, when we talk about this call to follow Jesus, there's one verse in the Bible that comes to my mind. It describes Peter. You know, the night of Jesus' betrayal, the night before his death, Peter was following Jesus, but he was following him at a distance. He still wanted to follow, but just not as closely and passionately as he did at first. He was fearful. He was scared. And he slowly began to drift and distance himself from Jesus. And this eventually led to his denial. What about you? How closely are you following Jesus? Are you bumping in his back because you're so close to following him? Or is he far away and you're following him from a distance? It's so easy to allow a distance or gap to occur in our life and in our fellowship of Jesus. You know, it always starts off in small ways. Maybe a really busy or stressful time where you just, you skipped out on that quiet time. You know, you skip out on that quiet time. And then before you know it, your, your heart for the loss starts to 
taper off and you don't get in that Bible study. You don't prioritize going to midweek that week. You're like, ah, it's no big deal. It's just a little bit. It's just happening slowly. But then you dabble back in some old sin that used to plague your life. Now you're embarrassed and ashamed and you start to distance yourself from the brothers and from the sisters. And now you start feeling weird coming to meetings of the body. And before you know it, your, your, heart, your heart is getting hardened and you're being deceived by sin's deceitfulness. And before you know it, you're following Jesus at a distance. Now this last year was by far the hardest year of my life, of carrying the torch to follow Jesus. You know, Christina has been on chemo level treatment this whole last year, trying to uh, treat her Lyme disease and these other co-infections that she got when we were in Thailand. Many days she was bedridden, had to be carried around the house to use the bathroom to eat. This suffering as she's gone through this really serious treatment, daily migraines, fatigue, chronic pain. You know, just recently, about two weeks ago, we found out that uh, Christine was miscarrying. And it's been a really hard two weeks. And uh, just felt devastated. You know, on top of these challenging health things, I'm so amazed by Christina. You know, she's been suffering so much, and yet Jesus is first in her life. He's the one that he, she follows wholeheartedly and fervently, and it inspires me. You know, I love being a campus minister. Our group was about 115 students this time a year ago, and you can just imagine what happens with that many students. There's so many needs and, and so many things going on in, in, in their lives and in your lives, and, and as we're trying to lead them, and then we oversee the Rocky Mountain campuses, which we love doing and love working with the campus ministers here. Uh, you know, this last year in Denver, we didn't have a lead evangelist for a long period of time, and all the other evangelists were having to, to, to pick up this extra work. This, this last year was so refining of us, and it was so much to carry. And Christina and I dealt with uh, a lot of challenging things. As there was some criticisms, some slander, some gossip that were going on about us, and man, we just had to really be gracious and work through. You know, I love the campus ministry, but it's always shifting. We, we had 30 people transition out of the campus and go to the singles and go to the marrieds and go serve in the teens. And our, our group has transitioned a lot of leaders. And now we have this need for new leaders to rise up. This kind of campus ministry never ends. And during this whole last year, too, my brother's wife passed away from cancer and left behind three young children that Christina and I and my family are trying to help to raise. Uh, a 16-year-old, a 13-year-old, and an 8-year-old. And uh, it's just been one wild adventure that daily picking up my torch, daily deciding to carry it and follow Jesus has taken everything I got and has worn me to the bone. Yet with all this against me, Jesus' words are true, that he truly is the light of this world. Whoever follows him never walks in darkness, but has the light of life. And I have felt that so deep in my soul. The wind has blown. The storm has raged. Satan has made his best effort to extinguish my torch, but yet it burns on. See, following Jesus is what keeps our torch alive. It's what keeps it burning. No matter what storm is raging in your life, Following Jesus is the answer to preserve the light and life within you. So many of us need to put our pride on the shelves. We need to hit our knees and say, I am nothing. I won't be anything unless I'm following Jesus with all I got. I know what it's going to cost to authentically follow him, and I do not care. Let me follow my Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we're only scratching the surface here in the Rocky Mountains of following Jesus. Until people on our campus scream, I want these people silenced. Until they shut down our, our, our ministries on campus. Until they kick us off. Until every soul on our universities has heard the word of God. We have not followed Jesus closely 
enough. And if you think I'm crazy, take a look at the book of Acts. True, authentic followers of Jesus lived on the edge, and the world hated them for it. But they turned the world upside down, and they set the night on fire. We must be earnest and eager to follow Jesus if we're going to carry our torches high and proud on our campuses. Carry your torch and follow Jesus. The second dimension of carrying our torch is this. You got to leave your fears in the darkness. You can't carry your torch and keep your fears with you. You got to carry your torch and leave your fears in the darkness. There's always fears we must face personally and in this world. Satan uses fear and lies as his top method to distract and disengage you from following Jesus. Fear whispers in our ear that we are not good enough. Fear screams, you're going to fail. Why even try in the first place? It provokes us to have doubt. It stops us from even starting and much less even finishing. Fear is something that we all have and face. No one is fearless, but when we trust in God, when we follow Jesus, we can face our fears with the torch in front of us and illuminate what is around us and leave our fears in the darkness. We're going to look at a story here in Judges chapter 6 through 7, about how God used a sub-average college-age student named Gideon to rise up and become a deliverer for God's people against the hand of the Midianites. God used a fearful coward to change the tide of an entire nation. In chapter 6, Gideon is in this wine press, which is a hole in the ground, and he's threshing the wheat. He's trying to get the wheat to come out of the stalks, and this is such a dirty job. Most people do this in an open area because you get all these particles and grains and and, and and all these pieces and particles all over you, and it's hard to breathe, it's, it's in your clothes, there's splinters on you. And he's threshing this in the wine press because they're being oppressed by the Midianites, and they're coming, and they're robbing the Israelites of the food, their harvest, enslaving them. And he's a coward in the wine press, threshing the wheat. And that's when the angel of the Lord appears to him. Angel of the Lord gets there in this humbling, humiliating situation, and looks Gideon in the eyes and says, Gideon, I believe, my God believes, you are a mighty warrior. Mm. He's going to use you to deliver this nation and to make it great for God's glory. <laughs> Gideon literally laughs out loud. <laughs> Good one. Um, you know that I'm like the weakest dude around. I'm a coward. I'm hanging out in the hole doing what should be done outside because I'm so afraid. You know that I'm like the least of all my siblings and offspring. Like, you don't want me. Go pick someone else. An angel of silence who says, no, my God has picked you. And he's going to deliver this nation through you. You need to get your act together. Gideon kind of perks up and like, man. Maybe this angel thing isn't going away. He says, you know what, angel thing, how about you chill here? I'm going to go cook some dinner for you and uh, present this offering since you're giving me such a, uh, a brilliant award tonight. You see something I can't see, so I'll cook you some goat. He goes, he cooks the goat. He brings it back to the angel. The angel's like, I don't got time for this, dude. Throw down your dinner. So he throws down his dinner on the rock, and he takes the staff. He goes, Sazam. and like this flame comes out, devours the goat meat, and he says, Gideon, we, we got to get ourselves together here. Like the Midianites are coming. I need you to become the man that God's calling you to be. Gideon's like, you still got the wrong dude, wrong man, dude. Angel says, I want to give you a task to do. You do this task, it's going to build your confidence. There is idolatry in this town. I want you to go tear down this Asherah pole and this altar. I want you to go do that. And that's going to be your first act that God's going to work through you. Gideon's like scared, and it's like getting late at night. He gets some of his servant buddies. They go out. They chop down this Asherah pole. It takes them all, about 10 guys, to decimate this altar. They do this at night because they are cowards. 
They don't want to be seen in daylight doing this. They go back, get a couple hours of sleep, and they're, they're awoken by the town being in an uproar, asking, who did this? Who destroyed our idol, our, 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 our gods here in this town? Gideon's like, oh, no. See, I told you I'm the wrong dude. I'm going to get murked even before I can start this adventure you want to send me on. And right then, there's some intervention going on. The crowd calms down. And, and the angel's like, dude, you're still God's guy. They're marching against us. I need you to get yourself together. Gideon's like, all right, man. You really want me to do this? I want you to do this test. And if you're really from God, this test will come true, and I'll believe you, and I'll be the dude. Angel asks what the test is, gets the test, does it. Gideon's like, that was too easy. Like, come on, man. Like, you got to make this look challenging. Here, do this test. Angel does that test. And Gideon's just like, okay, looks like I'm your dude. Like, I'm a some mighty warrior. Let's go get this on. And he goes out and he tries to, to draw warriors to come with him. And he, the army coming against him is a whopping 135,000. You know how big the army he gathered to come follow him? 32,000. How many people want to go to war with four to one odds? Outnumbered, four to one. That sounds like a pretty bad gig. I don't care how mighty of a warrior I am. That doesn't sound very good. But, you know, G, he's still game. He's like, all right, God, you said this. I'm in. 32,000 against 135,000. Let's, let's dance. God pulls... Gideon says, says, hey, man, Gideon, we need to have a little pep talk here. I think you have too many guys. Gideon's like, what? What do you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you need to announce in the PA system, if anyone's afraid, they can go home. Gideon's like, are you crazy? He gets on the PA system. He's like, all right, guys, any of you are trembling with fear, you can go home. 22,000 people left. He's left with a whopping 10,000. God says, huh, I told you, I'm the one who's going to make this war happen. I'm the deliverer. I'm the victorious one. Let's have another little pep talk. And he's like, not another pep talk. He says, no, no, come here, come here. Okay. I want you to take them down to the creek and have them drink water. The ones who drink like humans, we're going to send them home. But the special ones who drink like dogs, those are the ones I'm going to use to defeat the Midianite army. Gideon's like, are you kidding me? Goes down there to go drink. 9,700 of them drink like humans, and there's 300 special needs guys who drink like dogs. And he's just like, oh, man, that's the special group. That's the people I want that are more like animals than humans. Those are the guys I'm going to use to deliver you and this nation from the hand of the Midianites. What a horrible plan. So Gideon's at camp. He sends the 9,700 home. There's just 300 of them around, sitting around the campfire, and they're just, like, discouraged. Like, guys, how long do you think this battle is going to last? I don't know. I'd give it a minute and 30 seconds. It's like, I don't know. Let's see here. So God pulls Gideon aside again. Hey, man, let's have another pep talk. I want you to go down to the enemy's camp, and I want you to listen to what type of fireside stories they're telling. I think you're going to be really encouraged by what you hear. So Gideon goes down. He takes his buddy, P., GMP, they go down to the enemy's camp, and they're listening to the campsite, campfire story. And, and, and surprisingly enough, the Midianites are like, dude, I had this epic dream that Gideon and his dudes are going to destroy us. And the other guy's like, I had the same dream. Like, dude, we are so screwed. We're going to lose. Like, and this fear was setting through the camp. And Gideon's like, hey, P, you see that? Like, God, that's got this. GMP, they go back to camp. They wake up the 300 special guys, and he says, all right, God's going to deliver us right now. Here's the plan. I want you to grab a jar, a trumpet, and a torch. And we're going to go down. You don't even need a sword. Just grab those three items, and we're going to open up a can of whoop on the Midianites. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to break up into three groups. I want 100 over there, 100 here, 100 there. They walk. They make a circle around the Midianites' camp, and he says, all right, on my signal, I want you guys to bust your jars, hit the trumpet, and scream for the Lord and Gideon. These guys are like, this is a horrible plan, but you know what? We're kind of gullible. We're the guys who drink like dogs. Let's do this thing. We're going to pick up here 
in Judges chapter 7, verse 19 through 22. It says in verse 19, Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle of the watch, just after they had changed the guard. They blew their trumpets. They bust their jars. And three companies blew their trumpets and smashed their jars, grasping the torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets. They blew and shouted, a sword for the Lord and for the Gideon. While each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying as they fled. When 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords, and the army fled. And it says the army fled, and they start killing each other. They're so confused and so scared that they're stabbing, eye-poking, slashing, dicing each other. And Gideon and the, the special 300 just like, whoa, this is awesome. Like, God's delivering us. Like, we had to just bust the jar, make some noise, and carry our torch high and tall. And then once they realized that they weren't getting their hands bloody, like, hey, we should go jump in this battle. So they get down there, 300, you know, they're stabbing, they're jabbing, they're getting going. And then as the army's flooding, you know, the other 3,100 or, you know, the people who left scared, they see that the 300 special guys are throwing down. They're like, hey, we got to get in on this too. So they get in the battle. They slaughter the Midianites. God uses Gideon to deliver Israel and to raise up his nation to a great place again. This was crazy. But you know what? Gideon chose to leave his fears in the darkness and to believe that God was at work and God would use him in spite of what was going on and in spite of the circumstances that it was God who would make him victorious. G and his gang didn't even have to fight. God did all the fighting for them. All they had to do was leave their fears in the darkness and carry their torches. I want to ask you a question right now. What could God do with you if you left your fears in the darkness? If you left your fears in the darkness and carried your torches, what if you left your fears of failure in the darkness? This generation is so afraid to even start because we're so afraid to fail. What if that fear of failure went away because you chose to trust God and carry your torch. How many adventures could be in your life if you left your fear of failures behind? You know, from Genesis to Revelation, God is, God and his people is an underdog story. They're always outmanned, always outnumbered. The odds are always against them. Humanly speaking, it's always impossible. Yet with God, all things are possible. God is the one who turns failure into victory. But we got to leave our fears in the darkness. We got to leave our fears of our emotions in the darkness. You know, emotions are neither valid or invalid. They just are. And so many of us are letting our emotions leave us paralyzed to move, to act, to carry our torch, and to be who God is calling us to be. Our emotions are keeping us from starting. They're keeping us from finishing. Imagine what those 300 men must have felt that night, walking down to the midnight camp, all the anxiety in their heart. Man, I just got a jar, a trumpet, and a torch. Like, I am afraid. I'm petrified. I am so scared. But they didn't let their emotions stop them from trusting God. What fears do you need to leave in the darkness? Maybe it's the fear of loneliness in the darkness. We're so afraid to be by ourselves that we're afraid to act courageously and boldly that we may be standing by ourselves. You know, I guarantee you those guys were standing in the dark with a jar over their torch and the trumpet in their hand. They were so afraid. They couldn't see the guy just 10 feet away. They couldn't see the other hundred across the meadow. They were standing there by themselves waiting for that trumpet to sound. You know how alone they must have felt? Yet they chose to leave their fears in the darkness and trust that God was going to work. Some of the most powerful moments in my life have occurred during times of great loneliness. Some of my best friendships have been forged during times where I felt all alone, but yet God gave me just the right friend, the right person in my ministry to be a partner, to be that ride or die in the ministry, to go there. You gotta leave your fears in the darkness. We gotta leave the fear of judgment 
and the darkness. We're so afraid to do anything because we're afraid of what people think of us. Can you imagine how those 300 felt like once this story got recorded that they were the special ones? And that's special for good reasons why God picked to use them. What if they were so afraid to act? Because like, man, I don't want to be, I don't want to be this, the dog guy story. I mean, people 3,000 years from now are going to be telling the, the dog guy story. Like, I don't want to be that guy. Others' thoughts, judgments, opinions really don't matter. Only God's opinions and thoughts about you matter. God uses weak, broken misfits like you and me to do extraordinary things. He uses the weak to shame the wise. We gotta leave our fear of judgment in the darkness. We gotta leave our fear of the future in the darkness. So many of you are so afraid of the future that you refuse to live for today. You're so worried about tomorrow that you won't pick up your, your, your cross, you won't pick up your torch today and live for Jesus. You're too worried about so many things that you're stuck. And your fear has paralyzed you. The future is only scary for those who don't live intentionally today. After this epic battle, they went home heroes. They weren't thinking about tomorrow. They were thinking about the middle of the watch that night. The guard just changed. And God's going to do something incredibly epic because I'm acting right now, right here. And they went home heroes. Because they chose to live for today and not future. You know, I got baptized 14 years ago today, actually in Albuquerque. It was a campus swap to Albuquerque. I was studying the Bible, and I just, man, I had to make that decision. make Jesus Lord my life and get baptized. This was my freshman year of college. I was 18 years old. You know, there was nothing special about me. I was never a captain of any team. I wasn't a good public speaker. I had dyslexia and couldn't even read out loud. I wasn't successful in school. I was never the best at anything. God took this broken, weak, sub-talented person and transformed me. You know, facing the fears and lies I believed about myself for years, facing the opinions of others and the judgment of others, facing the fear of my future, embracing what God was calling me to be, forgetting who I was was this epic transformation that happened in my life. This, this gave me a great hunger to want to grow. It gave me a humility to, to want to learn and to be trained and to learn whatever I could from those around me. You know, the next year, I helped four of my friends become Christians. Uh, I started leading a Bible talk, not because uh, I was a good leader. There's just really not, no one else to really lead it. And, and most of the people coming out were my friends. And they're like, well, you got enough people to have your own group. Why don't you just have your own group? You know, the campus ministry in Denver at that time was just about nine students. And I remember I was learning, and I, I was trying to grow, and, and I, I was still so insecure, and I was so weak, and I didn't know what I was doing. But God was using me to leave my fears in the darkness. I remember on my first spiritual birthday, I was in Salt Lake on a campus swap. I got the call from Chris Reed, one of the evangelists in Denver, saying, there's an opportunity to go lead the mission team in Bergen, Norway. You want to go and lead that for the summer? I'm 19 years old. And they were saying, oh, yes, I will. Where's Norway? Like, where's Bergen, Norway? I'm there. I really didn't know where it was. Can you imagine a 19-year-old? I don't know how many of you guys are 19 on this call. Being asked to go lead a church planning in a foreign nation. The group was 14 disciples, and the next youngest person on that mission team was 32, and I was 19. And I was supposed to be the one leading it, preaching it, teaching it, keeping things going, discipling people. Some of them could have been literally my dad and mom. This was a crazy adventure. I was so fearful. You know, Nor Norwegians, they hate Americans, and they hate religious people, and I'm both. Uh, they, they are very white. They view me as not white. I stuck out like a sore thumb. I got there. I got yelled at, cussed at, spit at, heavily persecuted. But that time transformed me. And it's some of the most cherished memories of my Christianity was those three months alone in Bergen, Norway. You know, when I got back, start off my junior year of college, 
the church had asked me to go into the ministry and to lead the campus ministry my junior and senior year of college. I was 20 years old at this time. The only people younger than me spiritually or physically were the people I just helped become Christians, and the other half of the group was all older than me physically and spiritually. I was so afraid to leave this group, so afraid of what people would think of me, so afraid of whether or not I could do it. I was so afraid if uh, people would follow me, if people would trust me, if they would believe in me. Man, I, I'm so glad that I said yes, in spite of all the fears I was feeling, to say yes. It's amazing what God's done over the last 14 years in Denver campus ministry, going from a handful of students to this time last year, 118 students. I wonder at times what would have happened if I would have given in to fear and not trusted God. You know, I found out a week before I was getting married that I'd give one of the keynote speeches at the last vision conference. We're talking 18,000 disciples. I'm just turning 25 and I'm just getting married. And I have one month to prepare to speak in front of 18,000 people. This is a guy with dyslexia who can't read things out loud. You remember being picked to represent, I was the only person under the age of 35 speaking at this conference on the big stage. I was so afraid. I couldn't sleep the whole week leading up to it. Couldn't eat, couldn't keep anything in my stomach. I remember practicing and memorizing this and memorizing it and memorizing it. This was in 2012. I remember getting up there after just leaving the bathroom because I'm so nervous. Getting up on stage, I missed the last step and I trip. I almost, I almost fall over. I remember getting up and just, and letting it rip. I was so afraid, yet God moved. Guys, if we can leave our fears in the darkness, God can move so powerfully in your life. You know, Christina was just a weak, desperate kingdom kid looking for a change when she joined the mission team to Clemson, South Carolina. She was the only college student that went on that mission planning. By the time she graduated, there was nearly 30 students in that campus ministry. It started with her and God moving and her leaving her fears in the darkness. She was so scared, so petrified, and yet God used her. I remember the day calling up Christina and saying, hey, we got a position for you to go on the full-time campus ministry with me. And she was like, music's up. You know that I got a full-ride PhD lined up that I'm going to in August, and you're telling me in April that there's a ministry and there's an opportunity to go on the full-time ministry? She had never done the ministry, never done an internship. She decided to give up her full-ride PhD to go into the ministry and serve a group of seven girls at the time. It's amazing what God did through her as she left her fears in the darkness and built up the women's ministry here in Denver and in Boulder. Guys, when we leave our fears in the darkness, God does immeasurably more than we could ask for or imagine. I hope you believe this and trust this. Whatever fears are holding you back, leave them in the darkness. The third thing that we got to do to carry our torches, and this is a shorter point, is we got to set the night on fire. We got to set the night on fire. Carrying your torch has two goals that you carry it to the day you die and you never burn out. And the second one is you light up as many other torches in this lifetime. In the short lifetime that we have, we set the night on fire. That we help so many men and women become disciples, that we give them. The, the light of life that Jesus promised in, in John chapter 8, that we spread this fire across the earth, the ends of the earth. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16, that you are the light of the world. You're like a city on the hill. you got to shine so bright. Don't you dare put a jar on top of this. Don't you dare dim your light. You were created to set the night on fire. Paul says in Acts chapter, 13, verse, uh, Acts chapter 13, verse 47, is he's quoting Isaiah. He says, I have made you the light of the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Brothers and sisters, you are a light, and God has called you to bring his salvation to the very ends of the earth, every nook and cranny of the Rocky Mountain region and to the furthest reaches of this planet. We are to set the night on fire. Daniel 12, verse 3 says, Whoever are wise will shine like the brightness of heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness, 
like the stars forever and ever. Those who make disciples and who are righteous, they shine brighter than the brightest heavens in the universe. Those who lead others to righteousness, those who make disciples, shine like the brightest star in the sky that never fades and never spoils. We are called to set the night on fire. You know, I remember as a young Christian in 2006, watching the Fort Collins mission team be sent down. You know, it was just three people originally. The Rasmussen's were part of that group. Then they went to go lead that church with three people. And that church got over 80 people and still thriving today. Can you imagine what God was doing through this handful of disciples to go set Northern Colorado on fire? I still remember that. And it gives chills through my body, seeing them up on stage and watching them sit down, what God did through them. Now, I remember Max Anderson. I met him the week after he got baptized. He was a freshman at Boulder. He got baptized, went to Boulder. You know, Max, he's just an, he's just an average dude. He was an okay Bible talk leader, helped a couple friends become Christians, but he had some courage. You know what happened? He got picked to go lead the mission team to Grand Junction right after he graduated college. He left his fears in the darkness, and he went and he set Grand Junction on fire, shared his faith with thousands and thousands and thousands. He made disciples. He raised up leaders. I remember being on the call with Christina as we were calling up Alyssa. They were dating at the time. And, hey, Alyssa, are you willing to give up your very lucrative job in Virginia and come out here and make very little money and lead the church with Max and see where your relationship goes? And we were just kind of waiting like there's no way she's going to say yes. And she's like, oh, yes, I will. She left her fears in the darkness and set the night on fire. And she went out there and joined. And, man, things this went to a whole nother notch. Once, once Max got a suitable helper out there, they fell in more in love, got married. I mean, the church, it's amazing. You know, I remember praying in Albuquerque at UNM with Zico. He was a campus minister at the time, and he was going to resign from being the campus minister. We're out there praying on that campus that, that God would somehow raise up the next campus minister, that God would raise up a deliverer for University of New Mexico. Zico resigned, and about six months later, we're at the fall retreat up at, at Snow Mountain Ranch, and I meet this beefy, good-looking man, a lot like David, but named Armin. And Armin was studying the Bible, I said, this, this guy's an answer to the prayer we said just six months ago. Armin studying the Bible, he got baptized, God raised him up, and he has set the night on fire at the University of New Mexico. I remember meeting Armin that day. And seeing what God was doing, he was setting the night on fire. Now, I remember Cairo Springs just being a couple students. There's three at the Air Force Academy and like some singles that were part of the campus ministry. That's what the Cairo Springs used to be. And I remember me and some of the cadets were praying down at the Air Force Academy that God would raise up a campus minister, that we could get something going at UCCS. You know what? Later that fall, a young, zealous young professional, J.J., Say the Bible and got baptized. And JJ started driving up weekly and calling me weekly saying, Brian, will you train me in campus ministry? Will you teach me how to start a campus ministry? JJ was working full time, get out of his job at five o'clock, but go down and share his faith on campus, have a Bible talk. He wasn't even a year old as a Christian. He was driving hundreds of miles to Denver to get trained, to get inspiration, to go start a campus ministry and set UCCS on fire. I remember Rick leading his first Bible talk at the Regency dorms. He had just gotten baptized. He's leading his first Bible talk there. You know, in one fall semester, 10 people got baptized in that Bible talk. One of them was Turner, who grew up on the same street as Rick, is now in the full-time ministry with Rick. Rick set the night on fire. Guys, what stories will be written of the faces and names on this screen, of your generation of college students? What will be written and said about you? How will you set the night on fire in the Rocky Mountain region? Who will step up and help set University of Northern Colorado on fire 
you know, we hope in the next couple of years to have a campus planning at the University of Northern Colorado. Who will go and set the night on fire? Who will go and help set the night on fire when we send one-year challengers to start a campus ministry in Bangkok, Thailand? You know that one university in Bangkok, Thailand has 435,000 college students at it? That's almost more than the population of New Mexico. It's more than, it's the same population of the state of Wyoming. 435,000 college students at one university in Bangkok. Who of you will graduate and go on a one-year challenge to build a campus ministry there? Who will set the night on fire at CSU and raise up leaders who will evangelize all of Northern Colorado and Wyoming? Who will set the night on fire at CU Boulder and, be, and let that ministry become the boldest and loudest movement on that campus? Who will set the night on fire when Colorado Springs crosses that 50 disciple mark in the campus ministry and become a force to be reckoned with? Who will set the night on fire when Albuquerque's raised up so many ministers and leaders that there's, there's campus ministries in Santa Fe, New Mexico State, Las Cruces, and every junior college in between? Who will go and set the night on fire in Grand Junction? That Grand Junction will raise up so many leaders to evangelize the western slope of Colorado that we'll send out missionaries to Western State, to Adams State, and to Fort, Car uh, Fort Lewis College. Like, who will rise up and go? Who will set the night on fire at the U and let the University of Utah campus ministry, ministry be the brightest light in the entire state of Wyoming? Who will set the night on fire in Denver, Colorado? That we have a thriving campus ministry at every university and every junior college, every community college in the Denver metro area. There's so many unwritten stories that you guys will pin as you set the night on fire. Guys, we've been called to carry our torch, to carry our torch and follow Jesus wholeheartedly. We've been called to leave our fears in the darkness and pick up our torch and follow God with courage and with strength. We've been called to bring his salvation to the ends of the earth and shine his light on every dark nook and cranny of the Rocky Mountain region. And God willing, he will use this group to do immeasurably more than we could ask for or imagine. Amen to that.